Hello, my name is Anis, and today I will be giving a presentation about wireless communication. We will start with a brief history of the radio, and then we will be diving into interferometry and the different modulation and demodulation techniques. This opportunity of research was possible thanks to the, the help of Professor Tatu, a man who works in the National Institution of the Scientific Research in Montreal, Quebec. He is part of the Department of Energy, Materials, and Telecommunications. By allowing us, me and my instructor, access to his laboratory, we were able to study how wireless communication basics function. First, I will be introducing some important figures in the invention of wireless communication. While the idea of electromagnetism and electromagnetic induction as well as wireless telegraph have been around since the early 1800s, James Clark Maxwell was the first to develop a theory of electromagnetism in 1873. Heinrich Rudolf Hertz proceeded to prove that the theory is correct in the following 10 years. Another popular figure in this discussion is Guglielmo Giovanni Maria Marconi, who developed the first apparatus for long-distance communication, as well as the Canadian inventor Reginald A. Fitzenden, who became the first person to transmit audio over a distance of 1.6 kilometers by means of electromagnetic waves. By the beginning of the 20th century, the various wireless systems using waves as a mean of communication have come to be referred to by the common name radio. Now that we are familiar with some of the influencers, we can proceed to discuss Marconi's first receiver and transmitter, as well as the process which followed, or the progress which followed. Here is a picture of the Marconi transmitter and the receiver. The idea here is uh, to press this black button on the transmitter commonly using Morse code, to induce a current and cause electromagnetic induction between two metal balls, right here. When this induction reaction is created, it transmits the message over a short dis distance to the receiver, which has multiple antennas right here. And in turn, this rings the bell. Marconi would eventually notice that the signal is transmitted over longer distances when in a higher altitude, and he will become the first man to ever send an overseas transmission across the Atlantic using balloons to lift the antenna. As the radio became more efficient, it increased in popularity. Here are some quick facts. The first radio broadcast was on January 13, 1910. The first radio station was made in 1915. By the early 1920s, commercial radio became a widely popular bean of entertainment. The radio became the predominant electronic in the household for the next 20 years since the television was not very available at the time. Now, here are some popular radio models released between then and now. First, 1910 crystal radio using quartz. 1920s. This one uh, was hard to use and had quite the low quality. 1933. 1940s. This is a Marconi radio. 1954. Zenith Transoceanic. This is a 1963 Bush radio. 1974 O'Kean radio. This one is in 1989, and this is uh, more in the 2000s, so we've already seen these last two being used in our lifetime. If you have noticed, the radio has come a long, a long way from being a big fancy object in the household to being a small transportable object. Uh, now we have many small radios, uh, whether it's on the phone, a computer, or uh, even inside your car. Later, the television became the predominant electronic in the household, starting in the 1950s. That's when it became much more popular. And with the beginning of the digital age, 
came computers and digital record keeping. These technologies distanced a lot of us from the radio, but not as much as the internet has. The radio is obviously still widely used today, and the concepts which first led to the creation of it are still used in the modern era. Some technologies which also use interferometry and similar concepts today are telephones, fax machines, the internet, NLT, long-term evolution. All right, so what is interferometry and where does it play a role? Interferometry is a family of techniques in which waves, usually electromagnetic ones, are superimposed causing the phenomenon of interference, which is used to inscribe and extract information. Using such methods, it became easier to use modulation and demodulation to transfer in a coded manner. Now, let us talk about modulation and demodulation. This is a rather simple concept, but it can get much more complicated when applied. Modulation is a process of encoding information in a transmitted signal, while demodulation is the process of extracting the information from the transmitted signal. For example, a message is sent from a source to a modulator to encode the message into a wave. Then it goes through the channel, which is just another way of saying it travels through a certain distance and goes into the receiver. Sadly, the world is not a perfect place, and therefore there is going to be some noise. In other terms, the carrier wave is going to be distorted by outside factors, and the message might get corrupted. After that, the modulator is going to decode the message, and send it to the destination, which technically is still in the demodulator. All right, here are some methods that the scientists use. I will explain these in further detail later. First, we have amplitude modulation, AM, frequency modulation, FM, phase modulation, PM, and there are also more complex ones which use a mix of the first three, such as Gaussian minimum shift keying, and others like QAM, Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, and PSK, Phase Shift Keying. These are a combination of uh, AM, Amplitude Modulation, and PM, Phase Modulation. They have both been used in this study as examples of the simplicity of interferometry. Alright, first we will be talking about PSK, Phase Shift Keying. It is a digital process which conveys data by changing or modulating the phase of a constant frequency or reference signal. It's also called a carrier wave. The modulation is accomplished by varying the sine and cosine inputs at a precise time. So, as we can see here, after four periods, of the carrier wave, it is going to be modified in such a way that it makes either a sine or a cosine wave. So it flips the phase of the carrier wave. In this example, the sine wave it represents 1 in binary, and the cosine represents a 0 in binary. So Whenever a computer receives this, they will receive a message saying 1, 0, 1. The data is transferred as, and decoded by the demodulator later. Next, we will be talking about Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, or QAM. This is a method of combining two amplitude modulated signals into a single channel, thereby doubling the effective bandwidth. So if we look closer at the bottom graph, we can see that the wave amplitude changes on both the top and the bottom. At the destination, the carriers are separated and the data is extracted from each. Finally, the data is combined into the original modulating information. Now, how does interferometry really work? At a basic level, interferometry is simply the combining of signals from two different sources. 
When two radio antennas are aimed in the same direction, they receive the same signal. But the signals are out of sync because it takes a bit longer to reach one antenna than the other. In today's interferometers, these are the antennas. The specific interferometer we're looking at is one by one centimeters. Now that you are a bit more familiar with the subject, it is time to finally talk about how we studied the phenomenon in the laboratory. Let's start with the setup. The researchers in the INRS use a basic two antenna setup. The modulator sends the carrier wave from the antenna on the left to the demodulator antenna on the right. Between the two, we can see an amplifier. In this case, it is a magnifying glass. The setup also contains digital oscillators and computers, which are used for reading and visualizing the results, speed, efficiency, noise, and other details. One more thing. Starting now, I will be deliberately using the terms transmitter slash modulator and receiver slash demodulator interchangeably, so pay attention to that. A test bench at 3 GHz was made in the INRS. For simplifying and understanding the concept of how the six-port interferometer functions, the basic setup contains the six-port interferometer. We can see four ports connected, one and three for input attached to the transmitter, and two and four for output attached to the receiver. The interferometer is attached to signal generators, modulators, and digital oscilloscope for displaying quadrature demodulated signals, I and Q. We will talk about this a bit more in detail later. No antennas are used in this particular setup. The transmitter and receiver are connected by coaxial cables to simplify the setup and its manipulation for learning purposes. The interferometer size is around 9 by 9 centimeters, plus external detectors at 3 gigahertz. In comparison to the interferometer we looked at in the previous slide, which was one by one centimeters, and uh, included detectors at 60 gigahertz, which is 20 times stronger, but nine times smaller in size. The interest to go high in frequency is to miniaturize and to increase the data rates. However, design, test, and fabrication challenges are important. The price to pay for going at higher frequencies. In this picture, we can see the interferometer used for this specific experiment. On the right, you can see the digital oscilloscope on top of the modulator and demodulator. Using this setup, it is possible to experiment with different wavelengths, frequencies, phases, etc. In this experiment, this digital oscilloscope was used to obtain different graphic representations of demodulated signals. It is also possible to obtain graphs for different modulated waves with frequencies of 3 GHz and data transfer rates of 10 MB per second. Since we are discussing this setup, and we will be talking about the results obtained, you probably are wondering what is it with the dots on the graph? The results of wave transmission in this experiment are in the form of graphs. Each of the large dot represents a symbol. Each symbol contains several bits, ones and zeros, the basic unit of data or information in binary. For each constellation, a symbol is composed of a number equal to 2 to the power of n, where n is the number of constellation dots. Before diving into any analysis, it is necessary to understand that these pictures represent a straight x y cut of a three-dimensional 3D graph between the demodulated quadrature signals I in phase output and Q quadrature as well as time in seconds in this case. Without going into details, the inputs received from the in-phase and quadrature components can be used to plot a distribution of bits on the I and Q plane. This involves some matrix divisions and can be quite difficult to understand. In other terms, the big purple or yellow dots, in this case they are red, represent symbols, an intersection between the waves or the phase difference between them. The smaller dots outside of the bigger ones, or the small scattered dots, 
with lower concentration represent noise within the signal being transmitted. Lastly, it is important to mention that an increase in the amount of data transferred, the speed at which it is moving, we need to increase the frequency of the carrier wave. Doing so decreases the distance on which it can travel. Looking at the results obtained for this four dot modulation scheme, we can see that the square we looked at earlier can be obtained by rotating the initial point in a clockwise direction. The symbols are placed on circles at minimum 45 degrees face shift one versus the other. The star modulations have an important advantage, which is why they are being used. The symbols are placed on concentrically equidistant circles. Here is the one for 8 star PSK, and using the second circle we can go to 16 star QAM. Since it is in powers of 2, 32 star QAM would require 4 circles. As you may have noticed, the symbols are getting cramped up together as we increase their number. So other configurations could work better for optimizing the distance between them and giving a clearer image. We will talk about this when we talk about the results. Looking at this first graph, we can see that it has four waves. In yellow is port 1 on the interferometer. In purple is port 2, in green is port 3, and in pink is port 4, as well as a graphic representation which is superimposed on top in the form of a square slash circle, as we know. If we take a closer look at these background graphs, on the other hand, we will notice that the yellow, port 1, has a wave that cancels the purple port 2 wave. Same thing goes for ports 3 and 4 as they cancel each other out. When that does not happen, there is noise. At the bottom is a snapshot of the details about the waves being used in the experiment. Moving forward, we will start with the results. First is 8 PSK with 8 symbols. On the left, we can see that the star configuration matches the expectation. We can also clearly see an increase in the amount of noise as these points get closer. To get a better look, we can use a color grade format of the graph. Looking at the right, it is clearer that there is much less noise than demonstrated previously. Areas of higher concentration of bits in this format tend to the color yellow and lower concentrations, mainly noise, will be denoted in green and blue. In this case, 8 PSK means each symbol carries 3 bits since it's 2 to the power of 3 equaling 8. By trying to go further, we can try implementing 4 bits in each symbol, therefore making it into a 16 star scheme since 2 to the power of 4 is 16. Here is the results obtained for 16 QAM. As I mentioned earlier, there are sometimes better configurations than a circle. In this case, the optimal way to distance the symbols is a configuration in the form of a square. Looking at the color grade of this new graph, we can see that the amount of noise has significantly risen again. One step further, and here is a graphic representation of a 32 QAM. There are 32 symbols, each carrying 5 bits, because 2 to the power of 5 is equal to 32. While the system does its best to keep the symbols from interfering with each other and corrupting the data, we can notice the creation of some blue patches. Now, let us go even further beyond. While it is possible, it starts looking a lot more like a mesh. This is what 64 QAM scheme looks like. We can see lots and lots of interference, up to 604 to 810 bits as noise. While the concentration of bits also increases within each symbol, it is no surprise that the efficiency in the data transfer decreases significantly. Moreover, as I mentioned earlier, this increase in frequency of the carrier wave between 32 QAM to 64 QAM, for example, also decreases the distance which it can travel thereby further decreasing the efficiency of the transfer. Finally, we will be discussing what this study implies for our new technologies. As 5G is an emerging and rapidly growing business, which is becoming more and more popular, many people believe it is what humanity is destined for, an ever-growing internet speed.
But we have to take a step back and ask and answer a few questions. Since 5G internet must be faster than 4G, it will need to use a higher frequency. That would shorten the distance on which it could be transferred. In other terms, in order for a 5G connection to be viable as an alternative for 4G LTE, for example, more antennas than ever would need to be planted within a radius of 100 meters or so of each other. Otherwise, it would be as slow or even slower than other alternatives. Obviously, this being the case raises its fair share of ethical questions. What would this imply for the architecture of our cities? Would rural areas have access to this technology? If not, would this not increase the economic disparities between certain geographical areas and other countries even more? What would this imply for the use of our very limited resources on Earth? How can we possibly get the consent of the population to plant antennas everywhere without raising concern about their privacy? 5G does seem to, and I've specified the term, seem to carry more risk for our privacy. How can we possibly escape from hackers and geeks? Can we disconnect from the internet anymore? In addition, some of us might also be concerned about our health and our habits. Our lifestyles will forever be changed. Would the presence of such concentrated amounts of electromagnetic waves affect us negatively? What happens after 5G? Portable quantum computers? Maybe something no one else has thought of yet. Or have we reached the limits of our technology? I will leave you with this. Humanity has had many challenges, and this might just be the next one. To finish, I would like to thank Professor Tattoo again for accepting me and my instructor inside the laboratory. This truly was a great experience, and uh, I hope that this video was a fair an accurate depiction of the amazing work that the researchers in the INRS are doing daily. I am Anis and I hope you enjoyed this video.